dear Father, thank you for this night. Thank you for this day. God, thank you for all the good things that we have in our lives. Even if we're going through hard times or rough times, Lord, there's always a few things at least that we can be grateful for, for Lord. Um, thank you for our shelter, our clothing, our food. Um, thank you, Lord, for letting me be able to do something I really love and enjoy, which is streaming, playing video games, and doing Bible studies online, something I thought I'd never do. Lord, I thank you for that. And uh, Holy Spirit, you're just welcome here in this place, in this digital space, Lord, please come and, and minister to me and anyone who may hear this, Father God. Um, I pray that you would use me to encourage people, inspire people, comfort people. And um, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would also do that ultimately for everybody. Lord, that you would go into their lives, inspire them, comfort them, encourage them, um, build up their faith, build up their hope. Um, whatever they're going through, Lord, life is a trial and we go through our ups and downs, Lord. So we just ask that you come into our lives and help us, Father. And uh, again, thank you for this night and thank you for this uh, online Bible study. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're talking about John the Baptist and he recognizes that Jesus is, um, as he refers to him, the Lamb of God. And um, it, we, we left off where basically two of John's followers or disciples um leave john to start following jesus sort of i guess you could look at it or or basically their mission kind of changes once jesus arrives on the scene and john points him out two disciples immediately go and start following jesus and that's where we're going to pick up in the scriptures tonight but i just wanted to do a quick review of uh things that i think we take for granted as christians but remember the uh the definition of Messiah is the promised deliverer of the Jewish nation prophesied in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and then Christ means the anointed one. So I think it's just cool to have that in, in our mind. And I noticed recently that there's a lot of, there's a lot of tomfoolery going around with Christianity and there's a lot of false doctrines going on and there's a lot of, um, um, I, I don't know, conflict within Christianity. You know, Christianity has a lot of denominations and denominations can attack other denominations. And, and some denominations can get up, caught up on things that to me maybe aren't like, they're not being biblical exactly. Um, and, and vice versa, no one's perfect, I guess, of course. But there's, there's just like almost like a spiritual civil war kind of going on sometimes. There's also just flat out false doctrines and gospels being preached that are flat out anti-biblical or not biblical at all. And they're, they're men and the enemy twisting scriptures to fit agendas or things, you know. Um, but the reason I bring this up is uh, since we're talking about Christ and the Messiah, um, you might hear people saying like they get like bugged sometimes some people some denominations or some certain sects of Christianity saying like oh his name wasn't Jesus it's Yeshua okay so if you ever hear that yes G Jesus and Yeshua are the same thing right and I forget Yeshua is what it is in Greek or something I don't even know for sure but some people get like slightly bugged about that but since we're talking about Messiah, Christ, Jesus, I just want people to be aware of that. So, and Yeshua to me is a totally acceptable and cool name. I mean, I think it almost sounds cooler than Jesus, but don't let someone make you feel bad because you use the, the word Jesus or the translation Jesus. John chapter one, verses 35, no, no, 38 through 51. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. 
He brought him to Jesus, looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, or Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Be before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathaniel, oh, dude, that one makes me want to choke up a little bit. Um, Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Okay. So, Jesus is basically, you know, he's revealed himself to Israel. Um, John prepared the way for him. And now Jesus is being revealed to the nation of Israel and his people. And he's now gathering who will become his, you know, 12 right-hand men. Um, they're going to be... the the guys that he teaches and that follow him directly and become part of his his crew you know and jesus is now picking them out basically one by one and and they're seeking him you know and so the, there's so many good like metaphors and and things we can glean from these scriptures about like the dynamics of how god works and how jesus works when he calls him when he calls you to him um, so let's go back to the first verse I read. John 1 38, when he's, Jesus says, what are you seeking when the two disciples, um, turn to follow him? And this is cool because at my last men's Bible study, my Bible study leader, um, shout out to my Bible study leader, but he, he ended our Bible study on this open-ended question and said this week, as you go out, go out throughout the week, ask yourself, what are you seeking? also so i'm gonna ask my viewers to do the same thing um whether you're a christian or not or maybe you feel like you're being pulled towards christ um i want you to envision as if jesus was literally standing there and you're like following him curious and he turns to you and says what are you seeking i think this is like a good profound not just super easy to answer if you really search your heart and think in your mind what you're seeking um and i want to share like what i jotted down <clears throat> when i thought about this you know for the last few days deep in my heart i am seeking love peace patience joy etc all the good things about life and i have struggled greatly with finding those things my sin the world the devil have let me down in all of those areas um, so, so for me, like, I feel like for most of my life, I've struggled greatly with sin. I've struggled greatly with just submitting my life to the Lord and, and obeying him fully, you know, the most I can most often. And again, not perfect, not that I'm going to stumble, but I lived in like flat out direct rebellion to Christ for years. And I was trying to do the whole one foot in my sin in the secular world and one foot in the church and jesus and jesus says a, a kingdom divided cannot stand and that's been like a major portion of my adult life i've had a divided heart mind soul and i'm here to share that part of my testimony with people you know i implore you if you feel jesus calling you just submit and go like these two disciples just go and follow and seek him um if you're a believer who's in the same boat as me and you struggle with sin or you're just not willing to give up certain things um because you think you have more time or you'll get to it one day i'm here to tell you that living that way has the potential to like wreck your life destroy your life you know 
and that's what well, that's what happened to me and i'm still like kind of recovering from the effects of that and it's been a very painful lesson and i'm grateful that god god tore me out of it and i i that's just supernatural strength of god because I, I on my own wouldn't have quit the way i was with addiction uh addiction to weed addiction to booze and uh, having sex outside of marriage there's just like no way of my own volition power or accord i could do that and so i'm just imploring people if you're in that boat just get out of it now repent and do whatever you have to do you know of course seek the lord and pray but if you need the help of friends or family or or a church seek it out because followers of christ that's what we're here for when when the fallen brother or the prodigal son needs help i'm telling you there's people whether you think there is or not there's people that the lord will send into your life to help you um and you have to seek it out just like what these disciples are doing again there's this seeking that we all have in our heart okay um also with this question what are you seeking um sometimes i think um i don't don't even know what i'm seeking in my uncontentment and restlessness and that's just like a symptom or side effect of sin so your sin is never going to leave you content or or fulfilled you are going to always ultimately be um uncontent incontent not content and restless because that's sin does not deliver on its promises I think this simple yet profound question can also touch on what a person's motives are for seeking Jesus. We can all envision the cliche pastor who's asking his congregation for money so that they will be blessed. This is not what Christianity is about. When I was younger, part of my motive to seek Jesus was so that other people would look, look up to me and see what a great good guy I was. Um, and that wasn't a good motive. And this is going back to my early 20s. I mean, I'm like uh, early 40s now, so this is going back 20, 15 years ago, you know, but the young Christian me, there was an aspect of my ego and it was like, I wanted to follow Jesus so that people would look up to me and see what a great good guy I was. And I'm very thankful to the Lord because of everything I've been through in my life. He has revealed to me the true nature of what a sinner is and being broken is. And he broke me of my arrogance. And, and again, I'm not trying to sit here and say, oh, I'm like the least arrogant guy or I'm the most humble guy. I still struggle with it, you know, and there's moments where I catch myself that that old Steve or that old ego or that old pride wants to rear his head up. But I'm aware of it now and I can work on it as as before I wasn't. And so I'm so grateful for that. Um. So I think, you know, those are the thoughts I had on that question, what are you seeking? And again, um, before we move on to the next point, um, I just want you guys, whoever sees this, um, to ask yourself that, you know, if Jesus was standing there in his human physical form, in your house, in your room, on the street, and he turned and looked at you and said, what are you seeking? You know, you would ask yourself that, like, what am I seeking? And guys, I'm here to tell you, I mean, ultimately, the short answer is it's Jesus. He fulfilled it all for us. He did it all for us. In the end, we win. We have salvation. We go to heaven. And I'm not saying that from this moment on till the day you die or get raptured is going to be just roses and blessings over blessings over blessings. As a matter of fact, it's not. You know, it's going to be trials and tribulations. And there's going to be successes and victories and, and it's a battle i i often use you know the metaphor of a battle and that's just something that's close to my heart and and the way i see it you know all right let's move on to the next verse so john 1 39 he said to them come and you will see so they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour what what i feel like you know part of this scripture is that jesus has something to show us he has something to show us as a people as all, as his church all of us who are believers he has something that he wants to show his people um i think he, he wants to show 
the non-believers something and he wants to show the nation of Israel something, right? So that basically includes all people living in the world. Like God has something to show us. Jesus has something to show us. Um, and then this also goes for our individual lives. Like all of our lives aren't exactly the same though. Like people's testimonies of, of God and Christ can be similar. You know, they're also very different in the specifics of like how someone comes to the Lord are very different. So he individually has a plan for you and he wants to show you something. And you're never going to get to see that in your own life, right? Unless you again do what these disciples did and dropped everything to follow with him, to follow him. And then now they're going to go stay with him. Okay. So it's not just like, oh, I met Jesus one time. And then walked away and you're like, cool, I'm good. Like I met Jesus this one time, right? And we can compare that to like, if you have the testimony of the day you got saved and, you know, um, oftentimes it's an altar call or maybe a friend brought you to Christ. Uh, maybe you just broke down in your room while watching a tele evangelist say the sinner's prayer, right? There's a bunch of different specifics to the day and the time that you realized like you believe and you put your faith in God. But it's not just a one and done deal like oh yeah i got saved one time 15 years ago and prayed one time and then i just went back to my regular life and i'm a christian and too often including me i think that's what a lot of the modern church is doing i don't you know i don't know for sure i'm not a statistician but if i was a gambling man i would say there is a large percentage of the church that is in this boat exactly they they think i said the sinner's prayer one time a year ago, five years ago, 20 years ago, when I was a kid, when I was in high school, whatever, and never really spent time with Jesus though, as we see the disciples doing here, they then proceed to follow him and go stay with him, right? So this is time. We have to stay with Jesus. We don't just see him once and say hi and bye. We now choose to follow him and spend ultimately the rest of our lives seeking him and following him like this isn't just some wise philosopher or some really smart guy this is the son of god jesus god in human form you know and he came to show us the way the truth the life and it's actually exciting as you start to work through your your sins and issues that you have it, it starts to become really exciting of like wow what is the lord going to show me in my life for me you know okay let's jump to verse 42 okay um so it says uh he brought him to jesus looked at him and said you are simon the son of john you shall be called cephas which means peter okay um, so this is a theme we see throughout the Bible, right? So God, Jesus changes the names of several people in the Bible. Um, here, Simon's name is changed to Peter, which means rock and cool story, you know, but Jesus tells Peter, I'm going to build my church on you, right? And this is an honor because Jesus calls himself the rock or God is referred to as a rock. And here Jesus is changing um, Simon's name to Peter. And lo and behold, if we continue to read past the Gospels and we read through Acts, we see that Peter is one of the first guys, along with the disciples that are left behind, and along with Paul and maybe some others. Um, these are very spe special people in church history. You know, these are the guys who start the modern day Christian church as we know it now. What they started 2,000 years ago after Jesus' death is, you know, the, the, some of the writings that's some of the writings of the new testament you know and this was captured and recorded and we see the foundations of again modern day christianity as we know it um so these guys are special you know they're they're at a revolutionary time in the history of the world and like sometimes i i wonder if they even realize you know i don't know how heaven works i don't know if you get to look down on the earth and see everything that's going on like god um, I don't know if that's hidden for, from you, you know, I, I don't know, but I always wonder, like, do they really realize, like, the revolution that they started 2,000 years ago? Because remember, most of them, well, all the disciples were martyred except for John, right? So um, they lived persecuted lives, and, and Paul was persecuted, and 
always under the threat of imprisonment and was was imprisoned you know um so i can imagine those guys in their darkest hours having doubts and questioning and, and thinking like what am i doing you know i should just go back to the farm and live a simple life and you know get married and settle down but like their lives were like special you know and um we all have a role to play in the kingdom of god you know what i mean some of us are called to be fathers and husbands and some of us are called to be missionaries and some of us are called to be single and some of us are called to be persecuted man um but if it's for god and his kingdom it's going to be the most fulfilling thing that we can do with our individual lives because again going back to the last verse like jesus said you know come and you will see <laughs> jesus has something to show you but it's not going to happen unless we like give it all to him but back to this theme which is i love it i love anytime i read scriptures about people's names being changed right so um let's see god changed abram's name to abraham famous one and he changed jacob's name to israel those are the ones i could think of off the top of my head and I can't remember if there's other guys' names he changed. Um, but, you know, God changes our identity when we come to him. And when, we are, when we're we're 100% in, you know, he changes us. He changes our identity. We're forever changed and we do not see the world the same. And hopefully we're now on a journey to quote unquote change our name. You know what I mean? Like, I know most people aren't going to literally change their name when they become a Christian, though that would be kind of cool. But he's changing your spiritual identity, you know, and what you stood for in the past and in your sin is not what you're going to stand for anymore. You know, you're going to stand for Christ. And that's a huge sh change and shift in, in identity, you know, and it's, it's, it's again, it's exciting and, and awesome. And it can be scary at times, you know, like, a lot of the men that God called, Abraham, Jacob, you know, they were good and they were faithful and, and they're they're the they're like our spiritual godfathers going back thousands of years, but they were very much men with their sins and their doubts and their fears and and they didn't always do exactly what God called them to do. And, and a lot of men oftentimes men when he god calls them out to do something for him they'd be like not me lord you know choose somebody else but please not me um and so that's very relatable human thing when we start to hear the call of jesus we may be like ah, i don't know lord i can't it's not me this isn't my personality you know but it's just something that we have to work through you know once we realize what jesus did for us we're changed and we have to do something for him it's beautiful you know the way it works um okay so let's jump high, going through the highlights let's jump to verse 45 uh, philip found nathaniel and said to him we have found him of whom moses in the law and also the prophets wrote jesus of nazareth the son of joseph so just i wanted to highlight verse 45 because again here we have you know that these guys are going to become the disciples They've been talking about this. They've been wanting this. They've been feeling it. You know, they knew this was coming. And this is why I just don't get the disconnect when people are like, like, I'll be on, especially Jews and Muslims, but also non-believers when they're just like, can't accept that Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. It's, it's over and over in the Old Testament, guys. Um, there's tons of things that are pointing to the chosen one, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, the savior. And here he finally shows up, you know, he, he shows up finally the way it was prophesied. And look how, look how he was treated. The masses did not accept him. A select few group of men who were seeking God and wanted God found him and they loved him and they cherished him, you know? It talks about how when they start, it starts dawning on them that like he's going to be crucified or, or, or killed. They're bummed, you know, they're not happy. They're like, we found the fulfillment of the scriptures of what it says in this verse, Moses in the law. You know, Moses was talking about it. Um, there's even evidence in Genesis that, well, not even evidence. There's prophecies in Genesis that are talking about Jesus coming, you know. 
And so I just want to bring that up because this is all reinforced. It's not just man-made, willy-nilly. There's tons of evidence of all this, this, this amazing story of Jesus through history that's proven is historically accurate and true. So I just wanted to again bring that up because that's prophecy being fulfilled and the disciples recognize that. And then let's see, where is it? Let's go to 46. Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Um, so I, I, I looked up Nazareth. So when he asked, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Um, a modern day example of this is like, you know, a small town or a small town boy or coming from a small town or village of, of no reputation really, right? And you can sense the sarcasm in this scripture, like him saying like, oh yeah, the Messiah is coming from Timbuktu, you know, I don't think so. Um, but uh, I looked it up and it says, in the time that Jesus called Nazareth home, it was home to less than 300 Jews living simplistic lives as farmers and tradesmen in Galilee. They were mostly livestock farmers, herding sheep, goats, cattle, chickens, mules, donkeys, and camels, okay? Um, and I, I don't know where I saw this, but I saw it recently, but like shepherds were very like looked down upon. Um, you know, that wasn't like an honorable job or, or no one's writing poems about you or giving you any kind of accolades. You know, this is like a poor man's job, you know, and, and Jesus is called the good shepherd. So not only does God come in human form in his son, Jesus, he does not come as a rich and famous guy. You know, he doesn't come as one of the famous Pharisees or Sadducees of the Jews. He isn't born in Israel, you know, or, or in Jerusalem in their big city where the temple is he, he's he's a, a man from a nobody place a nobody town um and i also saw recently that the majority of people in the world will be born in an in a in an obscure town with little money in lower class you know the odds that you're going to be born into a, into royalty into riches and fame are very low the odds that you're going to be born into poverty um, in the lower class in an obscure city or town are, are very high. And I was just pondering this and thinking like, you know, wow, Lord, like you, you showed up for the least of us. You, you came as a, as a human, as an average common human with, with no quote unquote advantages in life. You didn't have money. You didn't have fame. Um, you were, as the world say, he was just a shepherd from Nazareth, you know, and um, I feel like even that example is him already like calling, calling to us. He knows exactly what it is to be a poor human struggling, you know, working a hard job, um, having no reputation, no, no one really caring about you. You know, I'm sure you've seen this, but like I've had friends and family that they live in big you know, famous cities in America. And they do have this attitude like towards people in Albuquerque or even smaller towns of like, oh, that's cute. You live in Albuquerque or, you know, whatever small town you're from, like, oh, that's cute. You live there. Like, you know, I live in New York or I live in LA. Like there's reputation just in that, you know? And hey, that's silly, but, but men, us men, us sinful men, we do look at those things and judge people based on that, you know, like, oh, you're just from Timbuktu. Um, but I think it's beautiful. And then remember, Jesus was also born in a manger. You know, there was no place for him. There was no place for Joseph and Mary at an inn, right? It says in one of the gospels, like, they're like, well, that barn's open. You know what I mean? And he didn't even have his own like room to go be in when he was born. He was born amongst the sheep and, and the animals and the cows in, in a barn or whatever, you know? And it's like, wow, Lord, talk about humble. You know, he, he didn't come in this splendid glory like that. You know, he came as the humblest of all of us. And I know that's just a, another part of how he is with us. It's him relating to us. It's him calling to us. It's him saying, I see you. I feel you. I know you. I understand you. 
Okay, so then we have some evidence that Jesus is God. So here's another huge debate we're going to get as Christians is where does the Bible say he's God? Where does the Bible say he's God? And this is why I always have, you know, if people are asking, I'm like, you just have to read the whole gospel of John and do the critical thinking and do the re reading in between the lines. You know, all the stuff they teach us in English class about how to analyze text. Again, I, I feel like that goes out the window when it comes to the Bible. I'm sure all of us can relate to like having to read some famous historical novel and your teacher dissected it, right? And you had to write papers and you had to do all these exercises around the text to get meaning out of it. I'm like, why wouldn't we do the same thing with the Bible? You know what I mean? Like, yes, it's the little literal words on the page, but just like literature is, if you read it all together, with the other scriptures in mind it, it's even more fulfilling and tells you more um but verse 48 is nathaniel said to him how do you know me jesus answered him Be before philip called you when you were under the fig tree i saw you um verse 49 nathaniel answered him rabbi you are the son of god you are the king of israel jesus answered him okay stop there but he has supernatural power he saw him before you know what I mean? Jesus saw what he was doing before he physically met him. So there's evidence of this supernatural God-like power. Who else can see all things and know all things? God, right? So Jesus has this supernatural ability to see somebody before they meet or whatever. And he's blown away, right? So, you know, Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe you will see greater things than these? And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. So I love it. And you even get the sense here that Jesus is like, thinks that's cute. Like, oh, you think that, you know what I mean? You think that just because I saw you, like, I don't know, an hour ago under the fig tree, you know, just because of that little uh, supernatural prophecy or whatever gift that is like jesus is like oh you think that's you know what i mean you're gonna see a lot more than that buddy um and again we can apply this to our lives when we're first called to jesus it might start off as a small thing but again back to what i've talked about in this bible study as we go and seek him he's going to start to show us more things bigger things more spectacular things uh deliverance from bigger sins uh, victory over bigger sins, uh, accomplishing things with our lives that are ultimately for him and, and the kingdom and the people in our lives that we love. Like he has more to show us. And I believe a lot of us are either new to Christianity or we've been like putting it off for a long time or like guy like me, I've been struggling with my faith for years. Um, we've, we've gotten a taste of it we've gotten that small taste of that supernatural God, God's supernatural, you know, and we've had that inclination on in our mind and our heart and our soul, but then we kind of pursue them. And then we're like, okay, stop. And Jesus is saying, no, come like, I have something to show you. I want, I want to show you something. Um, and then also with that verse, um, God sees us before we're even aware of him. You know, that, that was profound to me too, because here Nathaniel's sitting under the fig tree thinking he's all alone. And then when Jesus says this to him, I saw you under the fig tree. It's like God, God's all knowing, all powerful. He knows all of us even before we know him. Right. And it's like, we're playing catch up to learn about him. He's not like, oh. I just met Steve today and I got to do all this research on Steve to figure out what kind of guy he is and what makes him tick and what sins he's no, the Lord already knows me through and through before I was even ever aware of him. All right. And to me, that's comforting. Someone has our back who knows us fully. Again, he came as a human and experienced it for himself, but then he's also God and all knowing and all powerful. And he made us. Right. So there's nothing really that we've done that shocks him or freaks him out. He's like, yeah, sounds like Steve. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like something Steve would do. Um, 
We have a very personal God that wants a very personal relationship to him that is very special between each individual. Leaf wet be praying for you. I do, brother, please. I appreciate it. Um, I pray for my viewers and my friends daily. And again, like I said, you know, we all, you know, I think it's really good for us to start seeing ourselves as an influence in other people's lives. That's been very empowering for me. And, and that influence can be for good or for bad. You know what I mean? And so I'm, I'm getting really excited with the thought of like, you know, Steve, you can like go into someone's life and be a blessing to them. You know, and it could be the littlest thing. It could be like something so little to you that literally just makes someone's day or encourages them. So let's like start seeing ourselves as like, I have influence, like the things I say and do to people, it influences them. I think we get caught up like zombies thinking like nothing matters. You know, every day's the same. Clocking into work is the same. Um, and that's not, that's just not true. You know, that's that apathy, that apathy's evil. You know, it straight up is. And it seems harmless because you're like, well, it's apathetic. It's nothing. They just don't care. But that's evil. Um, dude, I, I know all too much about apathy, dude. I used to love Kurt Cobain. Okay. He was the king of ap apathy, dude. Father, um, thank you so much for this night. Thank you for uh, Leaf Wet and the girl called M. And thank you for this digital online platform um that i can use to do a bible study and speak the truth and read scripture and encourage people lord i'm so grateful for that and i want to lift up uh, the girl called M, and i just want to pray lord that you give her focus and that you give her a clear mind so that she can prioritize what's most important um set her priorities and attack 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 her problems or her obstacles in that way and once she's done that she can rest in you lord and and she can take the weight of the world off of her shoulders um i pray that you encourage her to work hard and work strong um and that she would have stamina lord and that you would give her energy and stamina to work even when when it's hard or study when you want to go to sleep or or whatever it is that she's going through with all the things in her life, working, going to school, um, doing the studying abroad program. Lord, I just, I pray that you give her focus and strength and stamina. And um, again, just thank you, Lord, for tonight. Um, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would go into people's lives, um, comfort them, encourage them, enlighten them, um, give them the strength also, like the girl called them, to just seek you and have stamina through the ups and downs, the goods and bads, that they would just never let go of you. And, and all these things go for me too, Lord. I, I'm in a battle in my life, and I just pray that you strengthen me to keep going and, and keep doing your will in, in whatever way I can, big or small. Um, guide us and bless us, Lord. Protect us protect our friends, our family, the people in our lives that we have influence on, that we love, that we talk to, that we see. Help us to be an example of love and peace and patience and kindness. What you are to us, Lord, give us the strength and the courage to be that to them. Uh, the world's hurting nowadays, Lord. It's obvious. It doesn't take much to see the hurt going on. Um, Give us the strength to be comfort and peace and love to those who need it, Lord. And uh, we, we lay all these requests at the foot of the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.